Good morning, and welcome to the 42nd Annual YWCA Leader Luncheon Women of Achievement Awards. I'm Gina Caruana, and I'm Senior Vice President of Consumer Banking with Illinois Bank & Trust. Illinois Bank & Trust has been rooted in the community for more than 25 years. We strive to make significant impacts for our neighbors. We believe in enriching lives, one customer, employee, and community at a time which is why I'm proud to present this year's event and provide critical support to an organization that served women and families in our state line since 1891. The past few years have taught us how vital the YWCA is. Like many businesses, the pandemic has required them to operate with fewer resources while serving more people. YWCA Northwestern Illinois provides critical services across the region. From child care subsidies to parent education resources, legal and support assistance for Illinois' most vulnerable citizens, to economic development and women's empowerment, immigrant advocacy to partner abuse intervention, YWCA is removing barriers and helping families to thrive. They stand up for social justice and strive to create opportunities to improve lives of all people. YWCA has been at the forefront of the most pressing social movements for 130 years. From voting rights to civil rights, from affordable housing to pay equity, from violence prevention to health care reform. We're committed to the Illinois communities because we're a part of them ourselves. Much of the assistance they provided during COVID-19 has been unfunded, but the work was crucial. They remain a nimble, valued, and committed community resource. And today, I'm pleased to kick off the 2022 Leader Luncheon and Women of Achievement Awards. Today, we will hear from Dr. Chandra Childers, an expert on social stratification and social and economic inequality. We are in the midst of a C-session that impacts every single one of us, and it's an important message to hear. We will also announce the recipient of three scholarships and present the Women of Achievement Awards. Illinois Bank & Trust is dedicated to lifting the achievement of women in our area. The Women of Achievement Awards will be presented in the categories of business, community leadership, mentorship, professions, and racial justice. I want to congratulate all of the nominees and applaud them for their contributions. On behalf of Illinois Bank & Trust, welcome and enjoy. Thank you, Gina. I'm grateful for the continued support and partnership of Illinois Bank & Trust. Welcome to the 42nd Annual Leader Luncheon. I'm Chris Makajewski, CEO of YWCA Northwestern Illinois, and I'm excited to share this year's Women of Achievement Award nominees and some outstanding high school seniors competing for three scholarships. Thank you for joining us virtually today. Like many of you, I really expected to be standing in front of you in person, feeling your power and energy filling the room. We've learned a lot over the last two years, including how to remain connected virtually. While it wasn't my greatest desire to assemble another virtual leader luncheon in 2022, keeping our friends and guests safe won out. I appreciate the grace many of you are demonstrating by sharing time with us today virtually. Your understanding means a great deal to the YWCA. And speaking of grace, our sponsors for today's event have blown me away with their support and generosity. And yes, grace. Understandably, sponsors want to make sure that their investment makes an impact. Thank you for sticking with us and seeing the value in lifting up female leadership in this community, even if it has to be virtually again. Leader Luncheon is the largest fundraiser for YWCA Northwestern Illinois, and during COVID, it's been our only fundraiser. The needs for services is great across our service delivery area. People are hurting, and the need for unrestricted funding that comes from our fundraising efforts is vital if we're to continue to provide outreach to those impacted most by the pandemic. My deepest gratitude goes out to presenting sponsor, Illinois Bank & Trust. Their continued partnership in not only our business, but our fundraising efforts strengthens our organization and ensures that we continue to meet the needs of those seeking our services to help build more stable family structures. I'd like to welcome Collins Aerospace as the vision and scholarship sponsor for today's event. Collins embraces the mission of the YWCA, 
lifting female leadership, supporting continuing education, and promoting diversity. Thank you, Collins Aerospace, for your support. We're grateful to our benefactor sponsors, ComEd, Gift of Hope, Lechtenberg and Associates, Mercy Health, and OSF Healthcare, who sponsored today's beautiful awards. Many thanks to our leaders in the workplace sponsors, to today's mentor sponsors, and our advocate sponsors. You too can easily become a donor to our event today by using the Give Now button on your screen. We'd love to see your name pop up as we move through our program today so that we can celebrate your gift and support along with our sponsors. Virtually or in person, the nominees for the 2022 Women of Achievement Awards are top notch. They represent a diverse range of professions, age and career seasoning, and they share a drive and passion to empower others and make a positive impact. I can't wait to introduce them to you. Whether or not you're an award recipient today, your work and commitment to our community is greatly appreciated. And I think all of you are amazing. So thank you for all you do. And thank you to the nominators who put together some fantastic nominations. Finally, I'd like to thank my committed YWCA team. Like many others, our team has adapted and demonstrated resilience to the storm that we've been experiencing. Simply put, they're amazing and I am so thankful to have them. The YWCA is also blessed with a strong board of directors, and I'd like to thank the women who choose to volunteer their valuable time with the YWCA board of directors. They contribute so much time and expertise, demonstrating a tireless dedication to the empowerment of all women and families. Ladies, please know that your commitment's appreciated. Speaking of strong volunteer leadership, I'd like to introduce our board chairwoman, Karen Brown. Thank you, Chris. I applaud our leader luncheon sponsors for having the understanding that during these unprecedented times, things have to look and feel differently, like today's luncheon. Today's sponsors have demonstrated a recognition that those seeking services from YWCA Northwestern Illinois are in greater crisis than ever before, and they're stepping up in their partnership to help us ensure that hand up is there when needed. Thank you to our community sponsors for seeing the value in supporting Leader Luncheon and the mission to eliminate racism and empower women. We all have hopes of a calmer, less challenging 2022, but we have to recognize the toll 2021 took on all of us. Each of us have weathered the storm differently, and we're all processing the trauma of the past two years in our own way. While the world continues to change and evolve as a result of the pandemic, there is one thing that has stayed resolutely the same, YWCA Northwestern Illinois' commitment to our mission. In these times of uncertainty, YWCA staff, management team, and board of directors have worked tirelessly to ensure that the more than 12,000 clients who seek our assistance continue to receive services that are critical to their daily lives, like childcare assistance, prenatal guidance and home visits to families welcoming a baby, eliminating language and cultural barriers for immigrants and refugees. We meet families where they are and link them with the supports they need to establish strong, healthy family units that enjoy stability. Over the past year, YWCA Northwestern Illinois contributed nearly $17 million in federal funds into our local economy while ensuring working parents have affordable and quality childcare something that has become so glaringly important during the pandemic. To support female entrepreneurship and help diversify business ownership, we've launched Diving Deeper to bring small business development to women of color in Northern Illinois. Our Chief Executive Officer and Chief Administrative Officer provided implicit bias and cultural competency training for more than 2,500 people in law enforcement, education, and human resources. We supported a thousand of Illinois' most marginalized residents with holistic legal and support services and provided trainings for more than 1,800 people facing cultural barriers. Unfortunately, domestic violence continues to soar and our partner abuse intervention program has quadrupled in size. 
Thankfully, our PAPE workshops adapted immediately and continued to provide remote and in-person classes to men who abuse their intimate partners. It's imperative that these educational services continue uninterrupted. Women's very lives depend on it. The impact of this program was brought home by a conversation with former participant Jose. Jose shared that the PAPE program was the turning point in his life and it gave him back his family. After having a drunken physical altercation with his girlfriend, Jose was court ordered into PAPE and DCFS prevented him from having access to his child. Jose began attending AA and successfully completed 26 weeks of PAPE classes. He credits it with providing him the communication skills he needs to talk about his emotions with his family because men aren't often conditioned to talk about what they're feeling. He said PAPE taught him to admit his own faults and to recognize that others are going through their own struggles and he doesn't have to react. He can step back now to see another viewpoint. Jose said that after learning so much about himself in PAPE that he wants to be the change for his family and his community and he believes he's a better man and partner for all that he learned. Instead of growing up seeing a cycle of abuse, his children will instead see a healthy man who is able to communicate with and support his family. Today, I'm asking you to join me in supporting the work of YWCA Northwestern Illinois in giving back to an organization that impacts so many lives, like that of Jose's family. You can donate right now using the Give Now button or by scanning the QR code on your screen. Thank you for spending this time with us today as we celebrate the female contributions to our community and lift up the mission of the YWCA in eliminating racism and empowering women. Thank you, Karen. In late 2020, YWCA USA partnered with University of Texas Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs to study the impact the COVID-19 crisis was having on women. I was riveted by the resulting report and worried about the future of women in the workplace. Global pandemics have been regarded as the great equalizers. Viruses don't discriminate based on who you are, where you live, or how much you earn. The COVID-19 crisis, however, has unearthed social and economic inequities that are jeopardizing half a century of women's hard-fought gains in the American workforce. We're living through our nation's first female-driven recession. Fueled by disappearing service sector jobs and a lack of childcare options, the COVID-19 health and economic crisis has triggered a nationwide recession. Nearly half of childcare centers are at reduced capacity or have closed nationwide. Working mothers have been left without care and one out of five childcare workers have been left without a job. 96% of childcare workers are female and they're considered low wage earners in nearly every state in the country. Over one third of childcare workers live below 200% of the poverty line and they require public benefits in order to support their own families. Women are overrepresented in the service sector, the first sector to shut down and the slowest to recover. Service-based industries are also the ones forecast to shed the greatest number of jobs in the next decade as a result of automation. Women account for 47% of the workforce, but 58% of their positions are at high risk of automation, including cashiers, receptionists, and clerks. Changes in the labor market as a result of technological advances had been on the horizon before the pandemic but the global health crisis has spurred the speed of automation. We now find ourselves at the dawn of the fourth industrial revolution, the first industrial revolution to take place where a majority of American women work outside the home. This is the first time we have the ability to design a future of work where women are a central component. I'm excited to introduce our keynote presentation today. Dr. Chandra Childers is a data-driven researcher who's passionate about identifying and eliminating social and economic barriers to women's equality in the labor market, their overall economic security, and the well-being of their families, particularly women of color. 
Her research focuses on education, employment, earnings, job quality, and the future of work. Some of her more recent publications include short-term strategies for addressing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on women's workforce participation, and women, automation, and the future of work. She was a member of the National Academy's 2019 to 2020 Committee on the Consideration of Generational Issues in Workforce Management and Employment Practices. She has presented her research at various policy conferences, including the Annual Budget and Policy Priorities Conference, the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute Conference, and the Women in Government Conference. Dr. Childers, welcome and thank you for joining us. Hello everyone. I want to thank you all for having me and I want to thank Jennifer and Chris for inviting me to speak with you today. My name is Chandra Childers. I'm a sociologist and I study a wide range of issues around employment and earnings and around gender, racial, ethnic and economic inequality. Today I want to talk a little about women, automation, the she session and the future of work. And I want to start with the discussion around automation and other technology and their potential to impact the future of work. According to the executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, we are now in the fourth industrial revolution. Techno te technological advancement today is described as moving at an exponential pace, unlike anything that we've ever seen before. So we have multiple companies testing self-driving cars, which are expected to replace taxi and rideshare drivers, as well as truck, train, and bus drivers someday soon. Robots have not only replaced manufacturing workers and warehouse stockers, they are also in operating rooms, flipping burgers in restaurants, they are making cocktails, and some are being developed to help provide care for the elderly. We all have virtual assistants on our phones. Grocery and department stores are increasingly turning to self-checkout, with Amazon taking that to the next level. And over the course of the pandemic, we all started buying our food, clothes, and household goods online to an unprecedented degree. These changes, which of course predate the pandemic, but they have expanded since, have led some researchers and policymakers, as well as many in the general public, to fear that a majority of the workforce will be left idle because their jobs will be done by technology. One widely cited study out of Oxford University reported that 47% of all jobs in the United States could be replaced by technology that's available already. Of course, as technology continues to advance and science has made it possible to do tasks that were thought to be impossible before, tasks like natural language processing, some fear that this might be an underestimate. However, the authors of this study emphasize that several, there are several factors that are likely to slow down this process of moving away from human labor and toward technology. One of these factors is the cost of automating work compared with the cost of labor. For example, companies that pay their workers low wages may not find that it makes economic sense for them to think about the costs of automation. But beyond the cost of replacing workers with technology, there are also some legal and ethical questions that we have to address, like whether we think it's safe to have self-driving cars on the roads with people, and are we willing to have robots taking care of our grandparents? In contrast to that study, However, there is another extensive body of research that is coming out of the McKinsey Institute, and it takes a different approach. Rather than estimating the probability of automation for each occupation, as the Oxford study does, this research team takes a detailed look at the tasks that people do in their jobs and assesses whether each task can be automated. They conclude that less than 5% of all occupations can be fully automa automated, but about 60% of occupations have 30% of their tasks that can be automated. So this means that most people's jobs will change with the most basic parts of the job being automated, allowing workers to expand the tasks that they do or focus more on the creative components of their job. A good example here is that of bank tellers. After the introduction of ATMs, people thought that bank tellers would disappear. But rather than disappearing, 
the share of their time that had been spent taking deposits and cashing checks was now spent selling financial services and other products. And the total number of tellers actually increased. Now, of course, as we are moving more and more to online banking, we are beginning to see the number of tellers decline. Um, the research, this body of research, however, it paints a less dramatic picture. Um, and rather than arguing that jobs will be eliminated, they simply predict that jobs will change, but they will change in substantial ways. And they will have different implications for workers with different levels of skill. Finally, there are the 10-year occupational projections from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They estimate that by the year 2030, the number of jobs will increase by 7.7% or almost 12 million jobs. So while many occupations will lose a substantial number of jobs, even according to their projections, most, of, most, job, most occupations will not lose it will not lose a significant number of jobs. And new jobs are steadily being created. For example, today we have jobs such as social media managers, cloud computing specialists, and app developers that didn't exist 20 years ago. And when we take these studies together and the other research um, around the future of work, it does lead to the expectation that there will be a great deal of change in the workforce. That while, again, most jobs will not disappear, many will change substantially in terms of the skill set that is required of workers. And the new jobs that emerge will also require very different skill sets. And that has really important implications. Unfortunately, very little of this research considers differences in the impact of technology by race, ethnicity, or sex. It is very important to consider these differences because women and men and workers of different racial and ethnic backgrounds work in different occupations. For example, women make up 94.6% of childcare workers and 96% of executive secretaries and administrative assistants, but they make up just 2% of plumbers and just 3.5% of welders. And we found that while nursing, psychiatric, and home health aides one of the largest occupations for Black women was not in the top 10 for white women or Asian women. And the pandemic provides a good example of how you can take a nominally race and gender neutral event or practice, and it can produce different benefits and different harms to different groups of workers based on race and gender. And that's because of the inequalities that already exist in our society. They build up on those. So when the pandemic hit, not all groups of workers were equally likely to be able to work from home, nor were all workers equally likely to have what was termed an essential job that required many to continue interacting with the public and putting their health at risk. And so according to data from the Economic Policy Institute, 15% of Hispanic workers, 20% of Black workers, 26% of white workers, and 39% of Asian American and Pacific Islander workers were able to work from home. And research from the Center for Economic and Policy Research shows that while women are roughly half of all workers, they made up 64%, almost two thirds of all workers in frontline industries. And these include jobs such as nurses, home health aides, cashiers, and fast food and counter workers. And while black workers was just 11.9% of all workers, they made up 17% of all workers in frontline industries. So what we wanted to do was take the research on the future of work that others had done and use their methods to examine the data broken down by race and ethnicity. So for example, the Oxford study provided us um, with the automation probability scores that they used in their research. And they provide this for more than 700 detailed occupations. We match those scores with data on levels of digital skill required in an occupation that we took from the um, Occupational Information Network or what's known as ONET. We combine that with data on sex, race, ethnicity, earnings, and other measures from the American Community Survey. And we took the occupational projections from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And what we found were, was that 
One, workers in low wage occupations generally face a much higher risk of automation. And that's true for women and men, and it's true for people of different racial and ethnic backgrounds. But we also found that while women were 47% of all workers, they were 58% of workers in jobs that had a 90% or higher risk of being automated. So the jobs that are most at risk, women are much more likely to work in those occupations. And importantly, it's not just that women are more likely than men to work in occupations with a high risk of automation. Women's jobs that are at high risk include both low wage jobs, such as cashiers and retail salespersons, and middle and high wage jobs. While for men, the jobs that are at the highest risk were primarily low wage jobs. But the risk of automation goes even further. Women's middle and high wage jobs that are at risk are easier and cheaper to automate. Jobs like office clerks, bookkeepers, accountants, secretaries, and administrative assistants. These are all jobs that software can be used to replace workers. To replace men in their at-risk jobs tend to require more expensive um, robots in factories and on construction sites are much more expensive. And you know the self-driving cars, while there's a lot of discussion about how many men, especially in the trucking industry, will be displaced, those are will be expensive and it requires extensive testing. Another concern for women is that while many of their high-risk occupations include low-wage jobs like cashiers and cooks that don't generally provide workers with good pay or with benefits like health insurance or a pension, and so therefore might not be jobs that we mind losing so much, they are also lose, um, many of their high-risk jobs are also more better paying jobs such as secretaries, administrative assistants, data entry keys, and office clerks. These jobs provide women without a college degree a pathway to the middle class. Losing these jobs mean that non-college educated women will lose many opportunities for upward mobility. This is especially important when we consider Black, Latina, and Native American women for whom these are among some of their most common occupations. Unfortunately, some of these jobs have already started to see a decline and are projected to continue that decline in the near future. Secretaries and administrative assistants, for example, have seen a 12.5% decline in the number of jobs since 2000, and they are projected to decline by another 6.7% by the year 2030. Worse, data entry keyers declined by 40% since 2000 and are projected to decline by another 22.5% between 2020 and 2030. And so that's the state of the future of work research that we had before COVID. So what do we know about the impact of COVID and the she session on women in work? The pandemic was dubbed the she session because it is the first recession that disproportionately impacted women workers. COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic in early March, 2020. Shortly thereafter, U.S. state and local governments, primary and secondary schools and colleges and universities initiated efforts to try and limit the spread of the virus by introducing social distancing and shelter at home orders. Governments closed schools and required non-essential businesses to shut down and encourage those workers who could to work from home. These policies were necessary, but they also meant that many businesses would be closed, some of them permanently. The risk was especially high for small businesses and minority owned businesses. This led to staggering job losses, a loss that was greater than, any, than at any time since 1939. In March of 2020, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that 881,000 jobs had been lost. And in April, another 20.5 million jobs were lost. These were jobs in leisure and hospitality, in retail, clothing and clothing accessories. Schools across the nation were closed, resulting in the loss of many education jobs. For example, the over 800,000 local and 176,000 state government jobs that were lost were mostly in education. These were jobs that employed large numbers of women. The loss of these jobs pushed the unemployment rate 
for all workers up from 3.5% in February to 14.7% in April. But where are we today? Based on the latest jobs date data up of from January of this year, we have seen a lot of job growth, but we still have not completely recovered the jobs that we lost to the pandemic. Two years later, we are still 2.9 million jobs short of where we were in February of 2020. That gives us an overall unemployment rate of 4% compared to 3.5% in February of 2020 before the pandemic. But that number reflects the labor force overall. For white women, the unemployment rate is lower at 3.1% while for Black and Hispanic women, it's much higher, 5.8% for Black women and 4.9% for Hispanic women. Not only are unemployment rates still higher than pre-pandemic levels, but there are also still too many workers who have not returned to the labor market, leaving the labor force participation rate below its February 2020 number. Many of these would-be workers, especially women, have not been able to rejoin the labor market. While some employers and policymakers have blamed the higher unemployment benefits, which have ended, um, many are overlooking the lack of childcare available to women who would rather be back in the labor market. We have a childcare system that was already failing to meet the needs of working families before the pandemic, when families already struggled to find quality, affordable care, and that's even harder to find today. Given all of this, where does that leave us and where should we be going? First, we must focus on job quality and not just job quantity. Whether we are talking about existing jobs or new jobs that will be created in the future, they should pay workers a living wage and allow them to balance work and family. According to occupational projections from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Home health and personal care aides are projected to add over a million new jobs over the next decade. That is the largest number of new jobs of any occupation. These workers are paid just $27,000 a year for full-time, full-year work. In fact, of the 10 occupations projected to add the largest numbers of new jobs over the next decade, seven pay less than $35,000 a year, four pay less than $30,000. And most of these jobs do not provide workers with health insurance, pensions, or paid time off. And in terms of technology, technology is not inherently good or bad. It is how we use it. We can use it for good. Robots, for example, can help reduce the number of injuries that healthcare workers experience by allowing the robots to lift patients. Technology allowed many of us to work remotely during the pandemic. But technology can also be used to surveil and control workers, from rideshare drivers and warehouse workers to office workers whose computers track the websites they visit and how long their computers are idle. Second, we must take seriously the need for a new approach to educating workers and the need for lifelong learning. Although many jobs could technically be automated today, it is likely that it will take a while to get there because, as I noted, the process is about more than simply having the technical ability to automate. Because the process will unfold over a longer period of time, we have time to begin to prepare workers for the jobs of tomorrow, especially ensuring that workers have digital skills and access to STEM. Research has shown that digital skill requirements have increased, have increased across occupations, and the returns to those skills have also increased. Some large companies are proactively providing their workers with this access to additional training so that workers can keep up with the technological changes they know their companies are implementing. But we need policies to ensure that all workers have access to these resources and not just those who are privileged to work for large corporations. And as we think how we, as we rethink how we educate and reskill our workers, we must include community colleges and expand access to apprenticeships and not just in the trades, but across occupations. So workers are able to keep up with the technological developments and get the training that employers are actually looking for without having to take on large amounts of student loan debt, which is another problem. It will also be important to rethink the way we evaluate worker skills. 
Focusing solely on traditional credentials may mean overlooking large pools of qualified workers who have gained their skills through non-traditional sources, including in a prior job, in their current job, or from learning from many online sites. And finally, even before, finally, we need to address our inadequate care infrastructure. Even before the pandemic, as I noted, quality child care was too often unavailable and unaffordable. And as the population continues to age, the demand for caregiving for elderly and disabled family members, a demand that falls disproportionately on women, is only going to grow. That demand is going to increase as we see in the projections for home health care workers. This requires an increase in affordable quality child and elder care services. And as we address each of these issues, we must be intentional about ensuring the inclusion of women, especially women of color, so that the future of work does not continue to reinforce the racialized and gendered nature of inequality that we see now. Thank you all for having me. Dr. Childers, thank you for sharing your research with us. It's valuable to understand the changes that are happening now and in the future to our workforce. I know this has given me an opportunity to assess how I'm preparing my own staff, as well as workforce development programs the YWCA may launch in the near future. I believe the information that we just received makes it all the more important to honor female leaders and their successes through the Women of Achievement Awards. Equally important is that we lift up our future leaders and we recognize their achievements with the Bright Future Scholarship and YWCA La Vosa Latina Scholarships. We are so pleased to acknowledge the dedication and hard work of all of our nominees. Thank you to the volunteer judging panels that review these nominations. It's a time-consuming job and we could not do it without them. As part of today's event, we're proud to announce the recipients of the YWCA Bright Future and La Vos Latina Scholarships. The last two years have proven how resilient and resourceful our students are. We're continually impressed by the applications we receive and the drive that each applicant possesses to make a change in our community. I'd like to thank Collins Aerospace for stepping up as our scholarship and vision sponsor this year, making these scholarships possible and for supporting the young leaders in our community. Now to announce the recipients of this year's scholarships, Collins Aerospace. From the smallest details, to the highest pursuits, we relentlessly tackle the toughest challenges in our industry. And every day, we imagine ways to make the skies and the spaces we touch smarter, safer, and more amazing than ever. We are redefining aerospace. Good afternoon. I hope you're enjoying the 42nd Annual Leader Luncheon. My name is Saba Jaffrey, and I'm the Executive Director of Supply Chain for Collins Aerospace. The mission of the YWCA is to eliminate racism, empower women, and promote peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. This mission reflects the vision and values of Collins Aerospace, along with our commitment to the greater Rockford community. At Collins, we believe in creating an environment where all employees can be themselves and share their ideas openly. We know that diversity drives innovation and we set out to provide programs and support opportunities that foster a more inclusive culture for our employees, both at work and in the community. We are honored to be this year's Vision and Scholarship Sponsor and to be able to have an opportunity to give back and invest in our youth in the community. This year's candidates demonstrated so much talent in both their academics and community involvement. You are an especially amazing group of students and I look forward to your future as leaders of our community. I am thrilled to announce the recipients of the 2022 YWCA Bright Future and Lavos Latina Scholarships. The Bright Future Scholarship is presented to a female high school senior showing promise for themselves, the community, and the YWCA mission. This year's Bright Future Scholarship recipient has been a valuable member and leader on both the varsity soccer and tennis teams all four years of high school. Also named a Nick 10 Scholar Athlete and member of the National Honor Society, this student has an extensive list of outstanding academic achievements and extracurricular activities in addition to ongoing philanthropic work. She is passionate about educating young people and intends to pursue a degree in elementary and special education after graduation. Congratulations, Olivia Repka, 
Hananiga High School. Because of the generous support of a private endowment through the Community Foundation of Northern Illinois, the tradition of awarding the annual Lavos Latina Scholarship continues. This year, two scholarships are being awarded. The Lavos Latina Scholarships are being presented to two high school seniors with academic achievements that indicate a high potential for success and a commitment to school and community activities. Our first recipient already has quite the resume, which includes exceptional academics, volunteerism, and an attitude that one teacher says will undoubtedly shine at any institution. She is a mature, passionate student dedicated to her studies and her love of storytelling. Her future plans include studies in journalism, Spanish, and political science. For her accomplishments, I am pleased to present the first Lavos Latina Scholarship, Crystal Sanchez, Boylan Catholic High School. Our second recipient began her essay with the statement, I will be the change. She has had to break language and cultural barriers and intends to continue that work. Her future plans include becoming an educator, aiding urban education, and continuing her fight for inequality. I am pleased to present the second Lavos Latina Scholarship to Sandy Ruiz, Boylan Catholic High School. Congratulations to each of you. Enjoy the rest of today's event. Congratulations to today's scholarship recipients. I wish you the best of luck on this next chapter of your life. Now, it's my pleasure to present the Women of Achievement Awards. I'm Penny Lechtenberg. I'm the principal and owner of Lechtenberg & Associates. We're a boutique law firm providing employment law and immigration law services to individuals and businesses throughout the U.S. and the world. I strongly support the YWCA mission and believe in serving as an example of a businesswoman who has sought out leadership roles and spent my career encouraging professional growth in others as I made my own way to business ownership. This YWCA leadership luncheon event typically coincides with the anniversary of the launch of my law firm in March 2016. We're now beginning our seventh year and going strong. This year's recipient of the Business Award encourages everyone to see beyond perfection and embrace differences. This award is presented to a woman in the business or nonprofit sector who makes a significant contribution in their field. Her nomination reads that this woman puts the heart in HR and has created one of the most amazing cultures throughout the organization. Her employees say she has brought a systematic approach while consistently maintaining a positive and outgoing attitude. I'm pleased to present this year's Woman of Achievement Award in Business to Rashonda Williams. Thank you, Penny. Thank you to the Rockford Park District team for thinking enough of me and my work to nominate me for this Distinguished YWCA Women of Achievement Award. I truly work with a team of amazing people. Also, thank you to the YWCA for providing this opportunity to highlight successful and hardworking women in our community that make a positive impact in the lives of others. The opportunity to work at the Rockford Park District has allowed me to grow as a person and professional. Rockford Park District is truly a caring and compassionate organization that provides top recreational programs and services in our community. I like to think that we're the best in the business. I do not like to look at my leadership position in a manner in which I know more or I am better than the next person. I lead with a servant leadership approach that drives me. I love to recognize and cultivate the potential in others. I solicit input from others, and I like to make things happen by turning thoughts into action. We all have professional and personal challenges, and I believe my professional career allows me to make someone else's life better. Whether it is helping employees navigate benefits to meet their needs, ensuring team members are compensated appropriately and competitively based on our financial ability to do so, developing or revising HR structure that meets the organization's needs. I am encouraged every day by strong women in my life, and one in particular is my mother. She always encourages me and tells me, you got this, you can do it. So with that being said, I will end with a quote that I love from Maya Angelou. 
I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Thank you very much to the Rockford Park District and the YWCA for this honor. My name is James Davis and I am the Vice President of Operations at Mercy Health. Mercy Health has been a proud sponsor of the YWCA for many years and is honored to sponsor the Community Leadership Award again this year. Mercy Health and the YWCA share similar missions. We both strive to make a difference in the community by improving the health and well-being of area residents. We applaud the YWCA for their efforts to eliminate racism and empower women through their life-changing programs and services. We are pleased to present the Community Leadership Award, which is presented to women who are professionals and volunteers in government, public service, politics, and community action. This year's recipient has been breaking barriers in a male-dominated field for more than 20 years. Her nominator said, integrity, active listening, motivating others, and soliciting feedback are some of her most respected leadership attributes. She is committed to ensuring that efforts are continued to empower others and focusing on equality. In 2016, she became the first woman in the history of the department to be appointed division chief, and in 2021, she was appointed as the first female fire chief of Rockford Fire Department. Please join me in congratulating the YWCA 2022 Women of Achievement Award winner in the category of Community Leadership, Rockford Fire Chief Michelle Pankow. Thank you, James, and thank you to the YWCA and to my colleagues at the Rockford Fire Department who nominated me for this award. Wow, what an incredible honor it is to receive the YWCA's Women of Achievement Award in Community Leadership. I'm both humbled and honored to receive this award, especially among a group of so many amazing nominees who clearly represent the YWCA's mission to eliminate racism, empower women, and promote peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. I've spent the last three decades serving this community as a firefighter for the City of Rockford Fire Department. And during that time, I've filled numerous roles in my organization and had so many opportunities to grow. I'm grateful to those who have mentored and supported me over the years, and I'm excited for the opportunity to pay it forward. I've come to realize that building relationships is truly the key to success. A bridge built provides a path and the relationships we build are the foundation that supports our ability to lead, and those relationships are what help us to critically think, solve problems, and most importantly, to serve one another. Thank you again to the YWCA for this tremendous honor, my leadership team for the most generous nomination, to my family for all their love and support, and finally, to the men and women of the Rockford Fire Department that provide excellent service to this community. Good afternoon, I'm Wayne Laramie, Vice President and Chief Nursing Officer at OSF Healthcare St. Anthony Medical Center. OSF Healthcare is committed to providing guidance to the next generation of leaders in our community. One way we do this is through building sincere relationships with others. While this may seem like a small thing on face value, the ability to take time, to understand others, to genuinely care, these are tenets of a true leader and skills that cannot be learned. At OSF Healthcare, our mission partners live this spirit each and every day with every person they meet. It's our mission to serve others with the greatest care and love. With this said, I am pleased to present this year's Mentorship Award. This award is given to someone whose mentoring has had a major impact on the personal and professional development of women and has fostered excellence. This award honors an individual who has taught guided and inspired women in ways that have changed their lives. The 2022 recipient has spent her career supporting, mentoring, and uplifting individuals. She has intentionally created a culture of learning and growth within her organization. As a volunteer in the community, she teaches aspiring, new and seasoned nonprofit leaders how to plan for human resources management and increase their leadership capacity. Her giving spirit, infectious laugh, and willingness to share her knowledge, time, and talents 
have empowered individuals and inspired them to be the best leaders they can be. YWCA Northwestern Illinois is proud to present the 2022 Mentorship Award to Ginny Weckerly. Oh gosh, thank you, Wayne. I was completely overwhelmed to learn that I won this award and I'm certainly in great company with other nominees. As we all learn, show gratitude, and help make paths for people, our communities and our world improve. I cannot imagine a bigger honor than being recognized for doing something I love. There have been so many meaningful people in my life and in my career who have shaped who I am. I'm so grateful for their support and that it's resulted in me being able to support others. I'd like to just thank my mom and my dad and my sister and Paul, and my list could just go on and on with wonderful people who truly influence my life. I'm extremely grateful to Goodwill, my colleagues and teammates who do wonderful things every day, and to Goodwill's leadership, past and present, for knowing the importance of individual potential. And a final thank you to the YWCA for the difference they make in our community and for honoring women and their achievements. Hello, I'm Marian Shuck, Vice President of Governmental Relations and External Affairs at Gift of Hope Organ and Tissue Donor Network, and I am here to present the Professions Award. Gift of Hope Organ and Tissue Donor Network is the not-for-profit organization that coordinates organ and tissue donation in Illinois and Northwest Indiana. We work with the families of donors, hospitals, and many other partners to carry out our mission to save and enhance the lives of as many people as possible. Educating the public and partnering with communities is an important part of what we do to protect and promote the health of all people and communities. The focus of our work with partners and communities is to educate and inspire individuals and families to say yes to being organ and tissue donors. And I encourage everyone here to realize how important that is and to learn more about our work on our website at giftofhope.org. But importantly, the value of our work is in connecting with cultural and ethnic needs of all our communities, especially in collaboration with partners like the YWCA. Together we make a difference. We are aligned with the YWCA in that we are passionate about empowering women, communities of color, and the underserved communities. We are committed to lifting people up so they are heard, respected, and celebrated for their unique talents, achievements, and the contributions they make to the greater good. This is part of why we are extraordinarily honored to sponsor this year's Women of Achievement Award in the Professions category. The Professions Award is given to women in the fields of medicine, law, education, science, engineering, architecture, or other fields which require professional accreditation in order to perform work in that field. Today, this award is being given to a woman whose genuine compassion for the children she serves, 61% of whom are young women and girls, is evident every day. Her nominator stated, she works in a heartbreaking and complex environment, and her talents for putting traumatized, frightened children at ease is commendable. Her accomplishments are too numerous to list and include the development of an acute sexual assault response team, related legislation, and educating professionals on child abuse and neglect. YWCA Northwestern Illinois is proud and honored to present the 2022 Professions Award to Shannon Kruger. Thank you, Marion. I want to thank the YWCA for recognizing me for the Women of Achievement Award in the category of Professions. I am so honored to have my work recognized in this way. To all of the nominees, some of whom I know and have worked with, you are all more than deserving of this award and I congratulate you on your nomination. My work with Merit is not done alone and many others deserve to share in this recognition. I would like to thank the University of Illinois College of Medicine, specifically Dr. Stagnero Green and Carrie Faust, who nominated me for this award, Dr. Davis, who has taught me to be the clinician I am today, Carol Schuster, who has been my leadership mentor and encourages me to grow in ways I never knew I could, and the amazing Merit staff. And lastly, my husband, family, and friends, whose love and support is what really keeps me going. The unfortunate truth is that one in five girls will be sexually abused by the time they are 18. 
a majority of those girls will experience their abuse as young children. Around 1 in 50 children are physically abused and neglected daily, and roughly 5 of those children die each day. We need to change those numbers. I believe all abused children deserve a space where they can feel empowered and safe and to receive medical care that's evidence-based, trauma-informed, and by an experienced provider. My hope is that all children at Merit start their healing process knowing that their body is healthy and belongs to them. In years to come, I hope they remember that we cared about what happened to them, we believed them, and we were one of their advocates. I am determined to lead our team at Merit in growth and expansion to increase our services in the future. Please remember, child abuse thrives in silence. Speak up and report abuse, even when it's uncomfortable. You may be the only person that does. Thank you. Hello, I'm George Gallramp. I'm the External Affairs Manager for ComEd in the Northern Territory. I'm very proud to work for ComEd, a company that has advanced equality and inclusiveness as a leader in the corporate world. Today, I also stand before you to recognize the advancement the YWCA has contributed in eliminating racism and empowering women. This is why ComEd continues to support the YWCA and their leadership each year. The Racial Justice Award is given for exhibiting an outstanding commitment to promoting racial equity and working toward the elimination of racism. Today, this award is being given to a group that recognized during the wake of civil unrest the need to have meaningful dialogue around topics like racial justice, implicit bias, and equity. Staff members participated in multiple workshops on topics of implicit bias and cultural competency, a clear example of recognizing the value and the importance of this type of investment. From holding restorative conversations about race to book studies, from ensuring a curriculum that celebrates contributions of people of color to surveying their student body, this group has been committed to providing all in their care a safe, supportive environment. Having already begun work on becoming a trauma-informed school district, they acknowledge that racism is a form of trauma and can create adverse child experiences. YWCA Northwestern Illinois is proud and honored to present the 2022 Racial Justice Award to the Belvedere School District 100. Thank you YWCA Northwestern Illinois for honoring us with this award. To the Belvedere School District staff, thank you for going on this equity journey with us. We appreciate your focus on reducing and eliminating disparities due to race, gender, and ethnicity. Thank you for your commitment to our students, parents, and community members to make Belvedere a great place to be for all of our families. Four years ago in the Belvedere School District, we led an initiative to implement trauma-informed practices in schools. We partnered with Dr. Soglin, a Chief Medical Officer in Chicago, and the Boone County Health Department to learn more about Adverse Childhood Experiences, or ACEs. Our work with Dr. Soglin emphasized the notion that racism is a form of trauma and that we needed to increase our knowledge of culturally responsive practices as an entire school system. Nearly two years ago, in response to the George Floyd murder, we intensified our equity work with a more significant focus on racial justice. We felt that a focused effort in this area was not only urgent, but a collective responsibility of our organization. During that time, every staff member participated in a two-part implicit bias training and discussion session. We opened up opportunities for staff to take part in equity book studies, curriculum and student data reviews, and roundtable discussions centering on our instructional practices. In summary, in the Belvedere School District, we hold high expectations for all students. We are committed as a system to provide the support and resources needed for students to achieve their full potential. As we continue to navigate our school system through the post-COVID era, we recognize that this is not an endpoint for our school district. We will continue to look for new opportunities to engage in work to increase racial equity. Thank you to the YWCA for recognizing our efforts with this award.
congratulations to all of this year's nominees and award recipients. To all of our guests joining me virtually today, thank you again for spending this time with us, and our sincere appreciation goes out to our sponsors, especially presenting sponsor Illinois Bank and Trust and Vision and Scholarship sponsor Collins Aerospace. After hearing our message today, I hope you'll join us in this work by becoming a YWCA member. You'll be joining a global movement to empower women, girls, and people of color to be equal, powerful, and unstoppable. You'll be supporting the 12,000 women, children, and families who seek our services each month right here in our community. Or if you'd rather simply donate to support these impactful services, you can donate right now using the Give Now button or scanning the QR code on your screen. This has been such an inspiring day, and I appreciate each of you spending time supporting YWCA Northwestern Illinois. Congratulations to all our award nominees and winners, as well as the scholarship applicants and recipients. I hope you'll join forces with us and keep the collective commitment to justice in our community strong. Let's do the work until injustice is rooted out, until institutions are transformed, until the world sees women, girls, and people of color the way we do. Equal, powerful, unstoppable. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at the 43rd Annual Leader Luncheon in 2023. Have a great afternoon.